everyone to our brand new innovation series of webinars where we invite you to meet our game changers. These are key opinion leaders who've been pioneers in adopting novel diagnostic solutions. So in episode three, we are joined by Olive Bumney Martindale Sheldon, who will be discussing how she overcame challenges posed by sepsis and in providing optimised patient care using BioFire. We're also joined by Kate Donaghy, who will be keeping an eye on the Q&A function for questions and also available at the end for our live Q&A. Uh, where you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and I'm sure Bunmi will be delighted to answer all of your questions so we'll deal with all of those at the end but you can pop them in the chat during the process. Um, just remind you if you've joined before that this is because this is a pre-recorded event you will have uh, full interactive access and be able to stop and start your own video. To be clear though this won't affect the video for anyone else but please bear in mind at the end of the runtime on my screen the live Q&A will start. So the full video will, of course, be made available on YouTube. The first two episodes are already there um, for you to view afterwards if you wish to go back to it. So without further ado, uh, we will crack on. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Kate. Uh, my background is in biomedical science. Um, I've been worked initially as a technical staff in the lab and later as laboratory manager. I've also worked um, in point of care testing, initially as point of care site lead and later as point of care testing manager for the network. Currently, I work as Directorate Manager at the Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust with operational responsibility for a number of services such as pathology, pharmacy, bereavement and medical examiner services. In addition to that, I work one day a week on a secondment role as the operations lead for building Berkshire Together, which is part of the National New Hospital Programme. So tell me a little bit about the site. Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust is one of the largest district general hospitals in the country. Our emergency department sees over 120,000 patients um, per year and 25% of those are pediatric. If we suspect sepsis, we take two sets of blood culture as part of their sepsis care bundle. This is the quality priority for our trust. Okay, so uh, talk to me a, a little bit about before the change and what the situation was like. Well, we were having issues with getting timely resolve back for patients um, suspected of sepsis, sometimes taking days uh, before we could get the result back from the laboratory. The consequence of that, therefore, is that our patients are not on targeted antibiotics on time, which therefore impacts their care and outcome. From what you've said, it sounds like there was a combination there of that quality aspect, but also that personal aspect. So and that patient care aspect. So I'm just wondering, was that coming from the lab? Was that coming from the clinicians? Was it coming from quality or was there a real unified approach that there was a recognition across um, different departments about the need to improve? At the time, no, there wasn't a unified um, commitment or approach um, across all departments. Within the trust itself, the clinical team, ourselves working with the clinical team, we are aware that, you know, something needs to be done to improve um, our patient's care. But we needed to get pathology on board um, with that because as far as pathology is concerned, they are providing a reasonable, good enough service. Um, so we needed to get them on board. Um, Okay, so um, take me back to the situation before you implemented a change. Thank you, Kate. So we were having issues with getting results back from the central lab on time for our patients. So it meant that patients were not on the right antibiotics on time. So, for instance, we had some patients that had bacteremia, but they were either on, you know, the wrong antibiotics that would cover the bug effectively, or sometimes they were not even on any antibiotics at all. So we knew that we needed to do something. And so that was the driver really for us um, to look at how we can improve the situation so that our patient can be on effective antibiotics as soon as possible. Tell me a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced in bringing in such a, such a big change. 
So the key challenge for us was that we were not meeting the UK HSA standards for all of our patients. The UK HSA recommends a turnaround time of less than or equal to 24 hours for pathogen identification with antimicrobial sensitivity when using automated or direct method. They also recommended a turnaround time of less than or equal to 48 hours when using the conventional laboratory method. But we're not meeting this for all of our patients. For some, yes, but not for all of our patients. The consequences of that, of course, is that there will be delay in initiating targeted treatments for our for all of our patients. So for our trust, there are several factors contributing to um, the delays with receiving the pathogen ID result back. I would focus on three of those. The first is our microbiology laboratory is off-site because we are part of a pathology um, network. So our pathology network operates a hub and spoke model and we're one of the spoke sites. So our central laboratory for microbiology has been moved off-site. The second factor is transport itself. The specimen transport itself is limited. So there are set times within the day that they will come to pick up samples. So that means any samples that we receive outside of those times would not be transported to the laboratory on time. So they will have to wait till the following day, really. The third factor I want to talk about is the fact that our laboratory opening times is limited. So our microbiology lab is only opened 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. And Saturday and Sunday, they are open 7 a.m. till 5 p.m. So they do not operate a 24-7 service. Again, that's a limitation in itself because then if you have patients presenting to the hospital with suspected sepsis, they will not be, you know, um, taken to the main lab. So what are the consequences of these delays on our patients? The first is patients are kept on empirical antibiotics for much longer than necessary. Of course, that means patients can be on inappropriate antibiotics or we are generally as a trust, we are using antibiotics ineffectively, which does not help the antimicrobial stewardship agenda. And most importantly, is not good for the patient in terms of patient outcome. Some patients based on their symptoms may have to be isolated to prevent spread. Our side room capacity is about 140 beds and 50% of those are within maternity. So we can't really use those to isolate um, sepsis patients. Another challenge, of course, with delayed treatment is the patient condition may worsen because we are not treating them, we are treating them blindly. So, and if the patient's um, condition, you know, gets worse, there is that potential that they will be escalated into level two or level three care. Such delays ultimately result in increased length of stay for our patients and ineffective use of the hospital resources as it impacts patient flow. All of this contributes to poor patient experience and outcome. It is important to mention that the risk of death increases 1.2 fold per day for every delay in microbiological diagnosis. So what, from what you've just said, it mm -hmm. seems that you really recognize that that time as being that factor, that really important factor that could impact things like the length of stay and the um, antimicrobial stewardship. So was that really about mating that time challenge and getting that result as fast as possible? Indeed, because we realize once we know what the causative pathogen is, everything else will follow quite quickly. Tell me a little bit about the changes that happened. What changed? What did you bring in? Mm -hmm. Knowing that time is of the essence, we put forward a business case proposal to pilot a 24-7 sepsis service on site using Biofire technology and BCID2 reagent panel. The Biofire BCID2 panel enables the identification of pathogen within 65 minutes. So that will be a game changer for us, really. The proposal also includes for the service to be hosted and run by Blood Sciences um, Rapid Response Laboratory team that we have on site. So I presented the business case, and although we initially asked for a three-month pilot, our trust executive felt we needed a six-month pilot to allow for more data to be collected. And so they approved the business case for six months, um, which we're really happy about. Prior to starting the pilot, 
we agreed with our trust executives what the measures of success were going to be. And those measures formed part of our pilot aims. So there were three key metrics that we needed to meet in order for us, um, in order for the pilot to be successful, basically. The first was the pilot needs to show a reduction in time to get um, the pathogen identification. So basically improved process. The second was there need to be a reduction in the time to effective therapy. So resulting in improved patient outcome. And then thirdly, there needs to be a reduction in contamination rates. Um, and um, we put that as less than 3%. We also agreed inclusion and exclusion criteria to make sure that we are good stewards of the money that we've been given um, for the project. So the first is the fact that we would only run um, a patient specimen on biofire if it flags positive within 18 hours of being incubated. The second is only we would only use on hospitalized patients so a patient is in hospital bed the third is we would only use biofire if the blood bottle has blood in it rather than fluid and lastly the other thing to mention is that we would only run biofire bcid on a single bottle within a positive set of culture so rather than running on all four positive bottles we would only run on one mm -hmm. Because I think it's a valid point that mm -hmm. obviously some of the barriers of this is around funding. By optimising the usage of the technology, are you getting more value from its implementation? Indeed, yeah. Definitely those criteria that we've put in place enables us to make sure that we are only using, you know, the reagents, the very, very expensive reagents on samples that really need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose you're, you're using it the way it's supposed to be you know, you're using it in the best way possible. Yes, for, yes, for what you yeah, have. indeed, indeed. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the stakeholders involved. But there's a few different numbers. You know, how did you get them on board? Thank you. So although I was the project lead, I would not have been able to achieve anything without the amazing support of the stakeholders. So what I did earlier on was identified who the key players were and um, I got their buy-in and I put together um, an implementation group. So basically responsible for the whole project from its inception through to its delivery and implementation. So um, that was really, really helpful. How did you pick those stakeholders? I, I think it's because we, it's about, you know, just taking a step back, looking at the project and knowing, you know, which department it's going to impact um, and then getting the leads in those departments involved um, within the project, mm -hmm. you know, in the project. Yeah. That, that, that was what made the difference. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we knew we'd need the antimicrobial stewardship lead. Dr. Walden, he was very helpful on board. Our clinical lead for microbiology, Dr. Aya, the trosepsis lead, the sepsis lead nurse, money that uh, we, we knew we needed to get our finance director involved. You know, then we, we knew that we needed to get um, microbiology involved, although they are not on site. We know that later when, you know, they, they would really be instrumental in helping us, you know, put everything together because they have the expertise. Our blood sciences team are the ones that will be processing it on site, but they don't have microbiology knowledge. So there, there needs to be a link between the blood sciences and the microbiology team as well. And then, as I said earlier, we are part of a network. So in terms of projects within the network itself, within pathology network itself, we needed somebody within that team to work within pathology um, to support the project as well. I think it's such a hard thing to get right sometimes is to get all the, the, the right people in mm. the room together. Mm. So I think mm. you need a pat on the back for that. <laughs> 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 Having you. it from the start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when the pilots concluded, I wrote a report and circulated it to the group first. So the group reviewed everything, put their comments in, approved it before I took it any further, you know, outside of the group. So again, I think that was really, really good because then, you know, it shows the hard work that we've all done together um, as, as a team, really. I am very grateful for the input and the support um, of the stakeholders um, because we wouldn't have been able to achieve that um, 
you know, the success with, without them really. Also, we had the support of the trust executives and the divisional executives, and that really helped. Um, I wonder about the clinical stakeholders. Were they familiar with Biofire or, because um, this is something I've just experienced in my own mm. past life, mm. the the change um, and the availability of the result. And if it's new technology, it's around um, almost like the, the trust or empowering the clinicians to actually act on the result. So was that really important to have a, the clinician in, in your working group um, really on board with the result and then being able to to get the clinicians to act on it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That, I think that was the driver, really, because they see their patients, that their patients are now are spending unnecessary time in the hospital. So they need there needed to be a change, if you see what I mean. So mm -hmm. they started that conversation that what can we do? And then we took it from there. Yeah. Mm. About the barriers, mm. was there many? How did you overcome them? Yeah, we did have several barriers. Um, the first was funding. Um, as you probably know, the BCID2 panel is much more expensive than the laboratory test. So as such, we needed to justify the clinical need for it. So we looked at the overall pathway of the patient, including, you know, appropriate use of antibiotics, you know, um, better use of the side room and better outcomes for the patient, finding out the source of the infection on time and treating it so that the patient would not stay too long in the hospital. So those are the key benefits, I think, and it's all centers around the patient, really, rather than the cost, the initial cost of the test. Although there have not been um, clinical trials to justify the cost, we do know within our system and from audits that if we have meaningful time frame for our pathogen ID, you know, our patients with suspected bacteremia will be treated much more effectively um, with better outcome for them. The second barrier was difficulty in getting pathology to support the initiative. We were the first trust within the network to ask for such a test. No other partner trust have requested for that. Secondly, the initiative would involve a change in the way pathology services worked. So for instance, we do not have an on-site microbiology, so the service we need to be run by blood sciences with no microbiology um, expertise. So it is different to what pathology is used to. We did have extensive conversation with pathology, basically highlighting what our issues are in terms of the fact that we needed um, you know, meaningful time frame for our turnaround time for the patho uh, pathogen ID. And we encourage them to provide us with a solution where like, we are not too, you know, if, if you have something within pathology that would enable us to have access to our results on time, you know, to help with our patients, then we are quite open. So we encourage them to put forward a solution, you know, um, within the central lab that would enable us to meet those challenges. So they came up with a solution to provide 24 seven service within the central lab and increase the number of transport pickups throughout the day. So those, you know, and have staff working in the lab 24 seven, those um, measures would definitely mitigate the issues. The cost of that doubled the um, biofire solution. So we included their solution within the business case that I presented as well as the biofire solution. And the biofire solution was approved because it was half the cost of the pathology solution so the third barrier was IT connectivity. As you know, um, it would be good to just have automatic transfer of results from the analyzer through to our laboratory information system and then onto the patient's electronic patient records. So we thought, let's get the IT sorted before we actually start the actual testing of, uh, as part of the pilot. But when we realized the IT was not coming on as it should be for so many reasons, we decided to go ahead with the pilots. We carried out a risk assessment, put some measures in place with some minimal manual intervention, basically printing out the results and scanning it and putting it on the electronic patient record. So, um, so that was a, a huge barrier in terms of it delayed the start of the pilot. But then we had to take the decision that we don't want it to keep delaying. Let's go ahead with the with the pilot and then later, then we can switch to automatic um, data transfer. 
The fourth barrier I want to mention is staffing. We had staffing issues, and that's because it was a pilot, so it was a six-month pilot, and so it was a temporary em employment. So staff that we got, when they see a permanent job, they would obviously go for the permanent job. So we had a high staff turnover. So those were the barriers, um, the key barriers that we faced um, during the project. Was it more around the partners that you had mm. for this project and how valuable they were mm. having them on board? Mm. I would say two elements to that, you know, the our partners in terms of the pathology network partners and also the biomario partners as well. I will talk first about the pathology partners. So once there was support for the project, um, we needed expertise from centralized laboratory to support the non-microbiology staff on site, i.e. the blood sciences staff. So for things like verification, you know, the SOPs, the training, and the, the quality assurance aspect of things. Also, we had to liaise with estate, our estate here, with regards to the safety cabinet, and also IT considerations, also liaison between the execs, executives, between, you know, the pathology network execs and our division execs, just to try and overcome some hurdles that we were going through and to move forward with the project. After all, this was a service they were not used to providing and it's been provided by non-microbiology staff. So we needed to make sure they have the support and our pathology partner really supported us with that. Once they got on board, they were really supportive throughout the project. So then I will talk about the second um, aspect of things in terms of the partnership we, we have with Embarmerio. Of course, the BioFire um, is a device that is provided by Biomario. So whenever we needed you know, support, Tom and the team, they were always there. They attended several meetings with us in terms of the IT, in terms of the verification, in terms of the training and you know all the necessary elements um, to make sure that we're able to implement um, the device safely um, for our patients. And they shared with us um, what some other sites are doing as well, which was really, really helpful. Mm, that's good. Mm. So do you think that that was helpful in terms of bringing, say, Biomary's microbiology to you know, and the the, um, the knowledge that we would have from microbiology too, to help you get this microbiology test into spoke. Indeed, right. very, very helpful and valuable. Having a company with that microbiology expertise really helped us as well. And then we tap into, of course, our own, I mean, off-site microbiology expertise as well, mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me about the impact of bringing in, bringing in Biofire. Thanks, Gates. Um, really, really great impact. We were actually surprised at some of the findings ourselves, positively surprised um, at some of the findings. Um, so the pilot demonstrated improved turnaround time from sample collection through to pathogen ID, saving an average of 17 hours per patient when compared with the lab, the conventional laboratory Molotov method. And if you remember earlier, I said the risk of death increases 1.2 fold per day for delay in microbiology diagnosis. So this cannot be overemphasized, the fact that we, were, we are able to save lives, you know, by getting timely results. The BioFire demonstrated high level of agreement with our central laboratory Molotov method, which was really, really good. It's essential for us to make sure that the method we are bringing in compares very well with the lab and BioFire demonstrated that. The pilot also demonstrated that 68.3% of patients were directly impacted positively in that their antibi antibiotics were either stopped or started or changed or de-escalated or escalated. The other benefits um, that the pilots um, demonstrated was the fact that we were able to quickly identify the source of the infection because we're able to get the ID on time, we're able to quickly identify what the source of the infection is. So for instance, if if it's um, the ID is equal, like you're thinking is urinary kidney or is the intra-abdominal, do you need to quickly do CT scans, ultrasound, you know, all of those so that you're not just addressing, giving them antibiotics, you know, Caring, basically treating the symptoms, you are also addressing the source. You know, if you have to drain, if you have to do anything, then you do that as well. So that was an amazing thing that we were able to achieve with the promptness of um, getting the pathogen ID. 
What we found from the pilot is the top three um, sources of infection were urinary, biliary, and skin and soft tissue. Our trend also shows that the length of stay follows the duration of antibiotics, such that one day less on antibiotics would expect a two-day reduction in length of stay for the patient. Also, some of the findings from the pilot shows that 14.8% of our bacteremic patients required level two or level three care. So that's another thing that, you know, people listening might need to consider for their hospital um, in terms of, you know, what the numbers are. Again, um, another finding um, was that 16.9% of our bacteremic patients did pass away, unfortunately. Again, it's something for trust to compare um, in terms of, you know, how do we compare with other trusts as well. The pilots showed that 66.5% of our patients were discharged. However, 15% of those patients were readmitted, but only 5.8% of those were due to infection. So if you remember, I did mention about the three primary metrics that were pre-agreed um, with the exec before the pilot. So the first one is reduction in time to get um, results for the pathogen ID. Yes, we did meet that because the pilot showed that we saved an average of 17 hours per patient compared to the laboratory, the conventional laboratory method. In terms of reduction in time to effective antimicrobial treatment, did we achieve that? The answer is yes. We were able to start patients on targeted treatment within 13 hours, and that improved significantly, improving to about three hours once the process became embedded within blood sciences. Yeah. So really what we found, I think, for us um, as a whole, in terms of the pilots, it's demonstrated that early pathogen ID facilitates early MDT conversation between the clinicians, between the surgeons, between our microbiology um, experts, between, you know, the infection prevention control team, between the antimicrobial stewardship team. So it's really, really helped. What are the plans for the future? So you've taken a big leap, you've made big changes. What's next? Thanks, Kate. So um, what's next? So sepsis um, service is now BAU. So after the pilots, I presented the results of the pilots, um, you know, through various committees and the trust has now funded um, the service so that it's now become business as usual, which is an amazing thing for our patients and for the service as a well. whole. So the next step is to review and centralize all biofire services into our blood sciences um, department. So at the moment, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have the blood sciences team, you know, looking after the biofire, the BCID to panel. There are some other work that is going on um, in parallel um, because we realize the potential of the biofire. So for instance, for the hot joints pathway, we're currently trialing the biofire in that area for our plant care. Also, there is the meningitis panel um, and also pneumonia panel that is in our ICU and AMU. So again, once all the work has been done, we would bring them all into blood sciences so that they, all the tests are done by blood sciences technical staff. The other thing as well that we want to work on is actually better governance and oversight of this. So but we believe once it's all in one place, you know, um, being looked after by blood sciences would have be much more better governance, you know, and we can look at getting you guys um, accreditation as well going forward for it. So it sounds like all of the work that you're that you're doing in, is to expand what you're bringing closer to the patient. Indeed. Really, indeed. And work on that time. Yeah, basically looking at the biofire and seeing other possibilities, you know, so basically meningitis, pneumonia, heart joints and anything else that, you know, we, we can use to improve the outcome for our patients. Yeah. Fantastic. And you've also said that you're working on the, from the sepsis perspective, it is that look at that pre-analytics. Um, and do you think that once you have, once you have that, you know, or um, progress is made there with your contamination, do you think that that will be your sepsis pathway optimized or will you have, is there something <laughs> else on the hit list? 
<laughs> Great question. I think definitely <laughs> that would optimize our sepsis pathway because I think we've got every, and of course, getting the IT. So I think sorting out the pre-analytical in terms of minimizing wastage so that once we collect the blood, there is few or no contamination. And then the other aspect of it is IT. So sort out the IT for the BCID2 panel and then sort out IT for all of the other panels we're bringing into the lab. So the meningitis, the pneumonia, the odd joints as well. Any advice? So if mm. anyone was thinking of looking to BCID2, mm. you know, what would be the advice that you'd give or what would be the mistakes that you, you'd say to avoid? Yeah, good question. In terms of, of advice, I think the starting point is you need to understand the importance of getting your pathogen ID in a meaningful time frame. If you understand that, then you can have that conversation with your central laboratory. If you're getting the result on time, fine. But if not, then question the process and ask for better. I think that is you know, the starting point. The second thing is, I would say, if there are issues, engage your trust executives and highlight those issues. That really helped us because the, you know, it was being driven by the clinicians and the consultant because they want to have better care for their patients. So that really made my job a lot easier you know, and then we had to then work with pathology to get them on board as well. The other thing I would say is engage your central laboratory and get their buying, but using data and objective evidence. So I think it's the approach again, you know, we need to approach them respectfully, get their engagement, let them know what our issues are and see how they can resolve that issue. If they can improve the pathology service such that it would meet the needs, fine. But if not, there are technologies out there because we're one of the early adopters of this technology and we're proud of that, you know, to see how we can improve our patient care because it's all about the patients at the end of the day. So that, that, that's another advice I would give. Lastly, I would like to say do not underestimate the impact this sort of project would have on your patient because through the pilot, we're actually finding out some things that we were not aware of in terms of the potential benefits for, for our patients, which I've highlighted um, through this um, talk. When you say not to underestimate the impact, mm -hmm. that's spurring you on to see that you've done this, you have the improvement, you've seen the impact. Indeed, indeed. And not just spurring me on, it's spurring almost everybody within the trust on, I mean, people die directly involved, like I see you, everybody's contacting me that they also want biofire, you know, for their hot joint pathway, for instance, and um, for meningitis, for new So it's, you know, because we brought everybody along, so we um, presented the findings. So they're like, what else can we do to help improve our patient experience, our patient outcomes, even our patient flow? I suppose that speaks to your your advice around collaboration and getting everyone together and making yeah. sure you use their time effectively. So bring everyone along for the journey. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Charlotte Bunny. It was fantastic. So I'll hand over to Kate now for the for the Q and A. Yeah, so but we have a few questions coming in. Um, the first one I'll go to there is, um, do you have, I would just say, Sinead says that the results are incredible. And do you have a plan to publish or share the results with other labs in relation to the clinical impact and the health economics and savings? Because I think that's something people are interested to try and maybe bolster their own cases to, to bring in new technologies. Thank you very much, Kate. The answer is yes. Um, we, yeah, um, I think we've been approached by a number of people to do exactly that as well. So we're going to do that and publish it. Thank you. That's good. I know someone internally here is going to be happy to hear that <laughs> as well. Um, so another question is, um, would you say that the Biofire project is an improvement on your conventional Maldi-Toff? So I, I, I'd imagine that's conventional um, methods. And if compared, which analyzer would you recommend for a microbiology that's in the process of getting one? 
Yeah, thank you. I think um, from the talk, yes, the answer is yes. Definitely um, an improvement from the more top method in, in, the, in the sense that it is on site with us here and it gives us prompt results, you see. So that really helps us. Once we have the results, everything else um, follows. Um, in terms of the analyzer or the device, I would recommend it's definitely about fire because that's my experience and it works very well. And we are also now using it for our virtual wards as well. So patients come through ED, they are in AMU, our um, clinical lead, Dr. Aya, our sepsis lead, um, Dr. Manish and Parker, alongside our sepsis lead nurse and um, Claire Bonnet, everybody working together, and of course with our antibiotic stewardship team, everybody working together and basically getting the patients in and helping them back home on time because nobody wants to stay in the hospital. Um, so it really helps us to get the result on time, put the patient on the right antibiotics, saving us a lot of money on anti you know, antibiotics because we are using antibiotics appropriately, and then help the patient put them back on oral antibiotics and then, you know, take them back home to their family and where they will have even, you know, um, better care. Yeah. Um, and that actually brings me really well onto the next question there that I see in the chat is, do you have any examples of uh, like a patient experience or a patient story, you know, of someone benefiting from the faster result? Because we talk about stewardship and everything, but, you know, is there any kind of little case study you could share? Yes, um, we've got a number of success stories, but I would share one just um, because of the time. So we had a male um, patient um, come, uh, you know, coming through our ED ambulance, coming through ambulance um, in ED. He was, um, I think, 44 years old, and then he came in with severe sepsis. Um, with septic arthritis of left knee joints. He's been unwell for three weeks. Um, issue of sore throat, acutely unwell for about two, three days before he was brought in. And of course, um, we did, you know, um, we took two sets of blood culture and knee joint aspirate and sent that to, you know, um, to the lab. So I, um, blood sciences lab on site. <laughs> and then um, we got the biofire result on site. But pending, when we got the biofire results, of course, we put them on, you know, um, empirical antibiotics, basically treating them blindly. And then they remained critically ill um, in septic shock. They were transferred to ICU. The, BC, uh, the blood culture flagged positive in the incubator. Biofire identified group A strep, streptococcus. And then so basically we started them on targeted antibiotics. And we also notified, this is amazing, we also notified UKHSA um, so that it can um, do contact tracing as well for close family and also institute um, um, prophylaxis, antibiotic prophylaxis um, for, for those um, that have been in touch with the patient. And then, of course, our patient became clinically stable in ICU. So we looked at the time, you know, um, that we got the biofire versus the time that we got the Morditov lab um, result. Um, the biofire ID was available within nine hours, 30 minutes of the patient presenting. Um, and for the more detail, it took 15 hours, 30 minutes, if you see what I mean. So really that's a very, very good success story because then we could quickly bring in the close family of the patient, put them on prophylaxis and all of that rather than spreading the infection around. So yeah, that's just one of the many success stories. Um, I, I think I've got some of my clinical leads on, on the call. Um, they, they keep you know, sending me, you know, um, cases just to show the impact of what we've done. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's the group based rep can be a scary one. So it's good to get that that result quickly. Um, I just see another question as well, because you've mentioned that it's it kind of going to blood sciences. Um, do you think that the biofire is easy for non microbiology trained staff to use in, in general? Um, are they doing any other tests? Is it just biofire? Good question. And I, the answer is yes, in terms of the ease of use of the device. Um, yeah, the training was quite simple. I used to work in point of care. So, you know, there are much more um, complex devices in point of care even than biofire. So, yeah, of course, with the right training, it's easy to use. Um, in terms, So it can be used by non-microbiology staff which is and we have a real life example of that because we've implemented this now um since last year we're using a bau and everything is going on well really so yeah they can use it um without any problems but of course with the right training sops and all of that and availability of technical support if they need that i mean that's that's great to hear and and do you think that um i i I can see Lisa's question is the the biggest health economic impact you've seen, um, which you've spoken about a little bit and the advice. But 
just sticking with the staff for for a little while um in terms of anyone who's thinking of bringing this near patient um and broaching that um discussion with non micro staff is there any advice that you'd give them yes i think it's about keeping things simple and also basically you know it's a simple analyzer um train them provide them with the right training but the mindset is you know it's been done elsewhere they can speak to people that are using it on you know on that site and you know together so that will help them but really we didn't have to sell it that much to the team if you see what i mean because we know the impacts um that it will have on our patients so knowing why you're doing something that, that you know the end goal is because of the patient if we get this result on time on site it's going to you know give better outcome to our patients so that really helped and also it's a simple machine to use and we also provided them with a training program SOP so if they forget anything they can always refer to you know those material so I think if you provide all of that of course support on hand then it should be fine but you need all of those together um, and people need to know why they're doing it and then it should be fine. I think that's really important because obviously sepsis and, and bacterium is something that can affect anyone at, at any time so you know any of those improvements that are uh, that make it better for people, I think is, is great to, to hit that message home. Um, if there's no more questions, if anyone wants to raise their hand there, feel free to do so. But if not, I will hand over to Jamie. Take myself off mute there. So just remains to be said, uh, thank you once again, all for, for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you. And thank you once again to Bunmi for that was, that was fantastic. It's a real, privilege to, to be able to help you tell your story and get it out there. Um, I should just also say, finally, um, if you haven't done so already, um, you can register for Catherine Moore's uh, webinar next week. That's our final episode, episode four, and that'll be on Fireworks, uh, the software which we have for providing dashboards for uh, surveillance of our um, syndromic um, uh, instruments. And if you uh, use that QR code there, you'll be able to get through to the registration page. So thank you once again and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.